UCLA acknowledges the Gabrielonino Tongva peoples as the traditional land caretakers of Tuvangar, the Los Angeles Basin and the South Channel Islands. As a land grant institution, we pay our respects to the ancestors, the elders, and relatives past, present, and emerging. Welcome everybody to our last pizza talk of the court of the summer quarter. And we're delighted to have Christine and Alan here. Uh, who will talk about one of our very own projects of the Coatsen Institute of Archaeology. Uh, as a brief introduction, Christine Martirosian Olszanski is a postdoctoral scholar at the Coatsen Institute of Archaeology, uh, where she is directing the research project program for Armenian archaeology and ethnography. She earned her PhD in archaeology from UCLA in 2018. And she has been directing the Masis Blur archaeological research project since 2012. As an anthropological archaeologist, she uses geochemical characterization of materials to study past human behavior. In particular, she looks at how farming communities of the Southern Caucasus make use of the available natural resources and how these behaviors influence the spread of technological innovation and social change. Alan Farahani is an assistant professor of anthropology at the University of Nevada, Las Vegas. He's an anthropological archaeologist whose research focuses on how ancient agriculture was embedded in and influenced the social, political and cultural practices of people in the past. His methodological expertise is paleoethnobotany or the analysis of archaeological plant remains as well as in the use of contemporary computational tools, such as Python and R, to effectively manage archaeological data. He has conducted field work throughout the world and has been working on the Masis Blur project since 2018. We are very excited to have you both here and are looking much forward to what is a very, very important subject for all of us. The earliest farmers of the Caucasus, a view from Masses Blur. Thank you for joining us. Uh, Dr. Wendyuk, thank you for the introductions. Um, today we dedicate this talk to the memory of Professor Gregory Reshian, the first excavator of Masses Blur, who passed away a little over a month ago in Armenia from COVID-19 complications. Dr. Reshian had a profound impact on Armenian archaeology. He was a wonderful mentor and a dear friend, and he will be missed. Alan Far Dr. Alan Farahani is going to get us started in the greater Near East. And as he comes closer to the Southern Caucasus, I will chime in, and we will go back and forth throughout the talk. Um, Dr. Farahani, would you like to take it away? Sure, thank you. Um... First, uh, I'd just like to say thank you for that very kind introduction, Dr. Bendrick, and thank you to all of you for being here um, and for the opportunity uh, for us to speak and present our research today. Um, we're going to be sharing uh, our screens uh, back and forth, and we're going to be using our formal titles. So I'll be referring to Christine as Dr. Marty Rosian Olshansky. Uh, so you'll be hearing that quite a lot. Uh, and uh, as Dr. Marty Rosian Olshansky indicated, I am going to start off by thinking about uh, and presenting information about this part of our uh, talk title, which is the earliest farmers. So what do we mean uh, when we say that we are looking at the lives of the earliest farmers in the Caucasus? Well, I just want to make sure that you can all see the slide change. Can you confirm that? Great. Okay. So who were the earliest farmers? Well, it depends on where you are in the world in the region of West Asia, what's today called the Middle East, uh, alternatively known as the Near East, uh, farming as a way of life emerged around 12,500 years ago. Prior to that, for almost all of uh, human existence for the previous 150,000 years, uh, or at least as soon as people arrived in this part of the world, they had been foraging and hunting for foods. Uh, but around 12,500 years ago, we actually see changes archaeologically in the plants themselves as a response to people experimenting with the process of domestication uh, 
all over this region. And in particular, you can see uh, there, these are all the archeological sites with dates next to them uh, that have evidence of early farming, especially the physical evidence of the plant remains that we'll talk more about uh, that have been modified in some way, larger seeds, different shapes, so on and so forth, that are showing evidence of this change. And as you'll see here, these sites uh, are arranged in what some have called a crescent, a fertile crescent, if you've heard that. More recently, the fragile crescent, but uh, I won't be talking uh, about that uh, in this talk. But what's really important to note is that in the sequence of how people slowly, in fact, start to adopt a farming way of life, what we see is people uh, experimenting with cultivation, selecting certain crops that they like, making sure that they grow. Uh, then we'll see an adoption of domestication of animals, so behavioral changes through selective breeding. Uh, and then pottery is actually the last thing to happen. And so uh, what we're, this period uh, is often called the pre-pottery Neolithic, the Neolithic being this period from roughly 12,000 to 6,000 uh, years ago, uh, in which we start to see um, the adoption of farming as a way of life. And it's important to emphasize that this wasn't like spilling water. Not everyone adopted farming immediately uh, as it was uh, introduced. In many places where uh, folks were experimenting with selective breeding of plants to consciously uh, propagate them. Uh, there were also other people who were uh, fishing, living next to foragers, living next to farmers who are also hunting. So there was a, a lot of var variety in how people lived their lives in this early time period. So what were those things that people were focusing on? Very briefly, it's a lot of the crops we know today. Wheat, barley, lentil, pea for plants, sheep, goat, pig, and cattle. And you can see here, again, that broad crescent and the dates in which we see the emergence, the archaeological evidence of these uh, animals being domesticated. And this change in life ways is called neolithization. Uh, and you can really see a nice example of this at the site of Jerf al Ahmar in what's today Syria. Uh, this is a room from it. Uh, the Neolithic means new Stone Age. And what we get is new kinds of technologies that emerge, new kinds of grinding technologies new kinds of uh, architectures that also seem to correspond to this change, not only in farming, but in how people live their lives. And of course, the plants themselves that people are uh, manipulating through selective breeding. Now you'll see here really quickly uh, that this is uh, the broad arc where we find all of these different uh, uh, archeological plant remains. But one of the things that we know very little about is the areas adjacent uh, to where uh, all of this action is happening between 12,000 to 8,000 years ago. We know a lot more about how farming uh, spreads into Europe than we do about how the people right next door uh, did or did not adopt this uh, way of life. And so Dr. Marty Rossian Olshansky will be speaking right now about the Caucasus in particular uh, and how this process unfolded there. Thank you, Dr. Farahani. As uh, Dr. Farahani mentioned, yes, we know very little about how the neolithization process or how the advent of these farming communities um, took hold in the Southern Caucasus. And this is for <clears throat> a few different reasons. And I, next like one moment. There we go. Um, as I said, there are a number of different reasons, uh, but for in the interest of time, we won't go into those reasons right now. What I will say that um, the first surveys and exploratory excavations of Neolithic settlement in the Southern Caucasus didn't begin until the late 1950s and early 60s, um, which is nearly half a century after similar work had already been underway in uh, in the Fertile Crescent region, as Dr. Farahani um, showed you. In any event, when the surveys um, took place, uh, the original excavators were 
able to identify five regions in the Southern Caucasus that had Neolithic settlements. And these are on the map identified with these oval shapes. They are the Kvemo Karthli region in Georgia, the uh, Kazan region and the Mil Steppe in Azerbaijan, the Ararat Plain in Armenia, and a single site was identified in uh, Nakhichevan, although today we know that the site in Nakhichevan dates to the Chalcolithic period rather than the Neolithic period. Um, but anyway, these early farming communities are spread along a series of small tributaries of the Quran Araxis River, where there's plenty of um, arable land and water. Two things that are essential for um, prehistoric farmers, um, farmers anywhere in general. Um, Excavations at these sites uh, show that the artificial mounds that are made up of many layers of occupational debris, in other words, the deteriorated homes and all materials that were used and discarded during the day-to-day -day activities, um, and the individual settlements are made up of densely clustered, smallish circular architecture made from unbaked mud brick, and the houses were connected to one another by small courtyards and walls. And you can see here on the left side, um, two artistic uh, reconstructions of what these settlements might have looked like. Um, uh, and these are reconstructions of the site of Shomutepe in Azerbaijan. And on the right side, you see actual images from the 19, 1950s excavations of Shomutepe in Azerbaijan and the site of Aruhlo in Georgia um, from the excavations of 50s and then more recent excavations that took place in the 2000s. Um, the associated finds or the material culture um, of the late Neolithic communities uh, is pretty typical to what we see in the Near East. These include domesticated plants and animals with sheep and goat being predominant particularly in the early phases of occupation and then pig and, uh, pigs and cattle kind of start picking up in uh, numbers. Um, there are also grinding stones used from processing grain cereals and as we will see pigments, the local pottery is handmade and very coarse and also comes from the very latest phases of occupation. Although there is a very small number of finely made uh, ceramics um, that is imported from outside of the region, and we'll talk about that in a little bit. There's also an abundance of stone tools, bone tools. Uh, the stone tool is mostly made out of obsidian because that's abundant in the region as well uh, and has a very sharp cutting gauge. Uh, there are a few fragments of anthropomorphic figurines and some of the sites have a small a number of copper objects, mostly in the form of beads and unidentifiable fragments. Um, which is interesting for a Neolithic period settlement. Um, these settlements, because of the similarity of the material culture and the architecture, became known as the Shulaveri Shomutepe cultural sites, named after the first settlements of Shulaveri Gora in Georgia and Shomutepe in Azerbaijan. Um, what do we know from similar sites in Armenia? Um, the first site to be uh, attributed to the Shulaveri Shomutepe site uh, was the site of the settlement of Terut in the Ararat Plain um, during, uh, as a result of excavations that took place in the 60s. Um, and because of the, again, the very rough similarities of the material culture and the architecture of uh, Terut to some of those sites that had been excavated in Azerbaijan and Georgia, the original excavator Torosyan dated it to the late Neolithic Shulaveri Shomutepe culture. But again, today we know that this site actually dates to the Chalcolithic and not to the Neolithic. It wasn't until the late 90s when uh, renewed excavations at some of these sites, particularly in Armenia, were able to differentiate between the Neolithic and Chal Chalcolithic period settlements, uh, both thanks to the availability of C14 dating uh, or radiocarbon dating and a closer study of the artifacts that um, these sites yielded. 
The projects in the Ararat Plain uh, uncovered well-preserved architecture similar to those excavated in Shula Veri Shomu Tepe sites, uh, but there were some key differences um, that they noted both in the architecture and the material culture, uh, which indicated that a regional variant of the Shula Veri Shomu Tepe culture existed in the Ararat Plain. So today, the late Neolithic settlements of the Southern Caucasus are a, referred to as the Arata Shen Shula Veri Shomu Tepe cultural tradition. And that is a mouthful. Um, what of Masi's Blur? Why did we start excavations there? And what can we learn um, in addition to what we already know? Um, before, before I give you the why, though, I do want to mention that the site uh, was briefly excavated in the mid 80s by Dr. Areshian. Um, when there were plans to, um, they had, the mound was destroyed. As I noted, all the uh, Neolithic settlement sites uh, in the region as a whole um, are, are mound sites. The mound, as you will see at Masis Blur, was destroyed in the 70s, and there were plans to put a railroad right through the site. So Dr. Arishan's team was tasked with uh, finding out what still remained below the ground, if anything at all, um, before the, lost was, the site was lost for good. Fortunately for us, those plans were changed, and even though the mound was gone, the site itself preserved. Um, so, at Masis Blur, um, we, we resumed excavations for a few different reasons, but in the interest of time again, I will only mention probably the most important uh, is because of the way most tell sites uh, in the Southern Caucasus and in the Near East uh, in general have been excavated, we have a very good idea of how long these sites were occupied for and how the settlement changed, but over time, but only um, across a very limited space. What we don't know um, a lot about is how the settlement size changes over time, how uh, various spaces were connected to one another, or what the spatial organization of the various activities which were carried out at the site, um, um, or if there was uh, at all any spatial organization, or if things perhaps happened like all over the, the site and with no sense. Um, so our goal at Masis Blur is to have a large horizontal exposure of, a, of at least a single occupational period in order to get um, answers to some of these questions. Unfortunately, our horizontal exposure is still limited, so we can't get to those questions yet, but we have already made several important discoveries, um, and I'll talk, we'll talk about those with Dr. Farahani as the talk progresses. But first, a very brief background of what we found in, during the initial seasons. Um, one of the first things we did is put a what's called a test trench or a deep sounding to figure out how, um, how many layers of occupational period do we have preserved below the plow, plow zone. And what we discovered that there's three meters or about nine feet of uninterrupted cultural layers at the site, um, which is quite a bit. Uh, and a series of radiocarbon dates based on charcoal and carbonized grain remains. Um, they decide to between 6200 BC and around 5300 BC. With the heaviest occupation falling somewhere between 5900 and 5500 BC. What this means is that a small number of um, settlers established the site around 6200 BC. The uh, population at the site starts going up around 5900 BC, hence we have uh, sort of more trash left behind and more uh, C14 dates for us to find and uh, examine. And it dwindles down by 5500 BC, probably eventually uh, leading to abandonment um, sometime around 5000 BC, although we don't exactly know what happens at Masis Blur since we don't have the mound, as I mentioned, the latest phases of occupation at the site. Um, the material culture, oh, the architecture. Yes, let's talk about the, their houses first. The built environment is very typical to what we have um, seen um, it, in the Southern Caucasus before, the houses are small, they're round, made out of unbaked mud. Um, 
uh, unlike the houses in jo found in Georgia and Azerbaijan, with our, which are made out of mud brick, and this was a key difference um, that the uh, excavators in the 90s noted between the settlements of Mar the Ararat Plain and the settlements in Georgia and Azerbaijan. Um, but similar to those settlements, these are no more than about four meters in diameter. Um, the interior of the homes are almost entirely devoid of any architecture, um, which all of these things um, show that the vast majority of food preparation, cooking, tool making, uh, basket weaving, and what have you, all of these activities that today we perform inside of our houses were performed outside um, at Massey's floor in these open courtyards. Um, so far, the preserved architecture at, um, in the art plane doesn't allow us to talk about these build, how these buildings were accessed, if um, access was through a doorway, um, similar to what you see um, uh, in this reconstruction of the Shomutepe site in Azerbaijan, where there's some evidence that there are doorways uh, and that the houses had a beehive-shaped roof, or if they were more similar to what we have found at sites such as Shat al Huyuk and other Neolithic settlements in the Near East, where the roofs were flat and access into the homes was through an opening in the roof. Um, what we do have though at Massis Bleur is some evidence of thatched roofs in the form of large reed impressions that have um, uh, inside the homes, which suggests that they were they're fallen in from above. Um, so we can't exclude that at least some of the buildings at Massis Bleur had flat or flattish roofs, but uh, this is one area where more research is needed. Um, so stay tuned. Uh, the material culture at this site is very much in line with what, ha what has been found in other settlements, so I won't dwell on this too much, except to say, you know, that, that we have bone tools, we have the obsidian tools in abundance, um, there are uh, the, the personal adornment uh, objects such as beads and pendants, as well as axe, uh, axe heads, um, and th th these things called uh, arrow straighteners. Ask me what those are later. Um, the uh, I will note in the in the uh, um, stone tool assemblages, um, there are old blades. Uh, it's a blade based industry. What it means is they're just making long knives and cutting that they use for cutting and butchering and whatever other activity you can think of. But there's also a few specialized tools. These are obsidian drills used for drilling holes. And you can imagine that these were made, uh, used for making uh, beads and pendants. Uh, and these little guys over here are called geometric arrowheads. These are used for hunting small wild animals. Um, the pottery uh, at the site is, um, it comes from mostly the, the plow zone area, the destroyed layers at the site. Uh, and, but there is an abundance of very rough pottery in those layers. What we do have in, um, in the non-disturbed context is very few fragments of imported, finely made pottery. And let me see if I can get my mouse to show up, the right that you see right over here in these two images. Um, the uh, both of these come from um, house from inside houses. They both to they date to the Neolithic period. Excuse me. The top one dates to about 5700 BC, and it belongs to what is called the Halaf material cultural complex, named after the site of Tel Halaf um, in modern day Syria. This type of pottery is kind of the defining aspect of the Halaf culture that has a relatively large geographic spread uh, in the Near East across uh, the Fertile Crescent, with its northernmost site uh, being Tilki Tepe in the southeast shores of Lake Van. The bottom fragment, this uh, orange guy over here with feigned black uh, painting is a little more mysterious and we have yet to figure out what it's doing in uh, in our Neolithic site because it both stylistically and technologically it is more similar to 
pottery that has been found from the Chalcolithic period. Uh, and you see a few examples of those here from the site of Mentesh Tepe dating to the fifth millennium BC and the same similar things found in the RNA1 cave um, from Armenia, again, dating to the fifth and fourth millennium BC, BC, which is the time period after the abandonment that Masis blew up. In any event, uh, uh, while the pottery is a few in number, um, it can still give us very interesting insight into the regional movement and interactions of these Neolithic communities. And we'll talk about those Neolithic uh, interactions in a little bit. What is not a mystery at Mustis Belur is pigment processing, uh, the evidence for pigment processing. Um, we have found chunks of various oxides, including copper oxides, hematite, and lemonite that were crushed down, mixed with clay and water, and even possibly oils to get paints, which they probably use for painting walls, basketry, leather fashioned into clothing, as well as most likely themselves. Uh, we're still in the process of analyzing these pigments using various techniques with our very own Vanessa Muros, who is the director of the Experimental Archaeology Lab at the Coatsen. So uh, stay tuned for results in future talks. Um, and I think I'm going to uh, sum up uh, my part here and hand it off to Dr. Farahani to talk about some of the uh, more recent things we've been doing at Masi Spillor. Dr. Farahani. I'm just going to give you a very brief overview of what we have been doing at the site to uh, answer these questions about not only the process of Neolithization, uh, but people's daily lives. Uh, and so that includes, among other things, since 2018, increased high resolution mapping. Some of you may have seen uh, this device on the roadside uh, for surveyors who are doing construction. This is a surveying tool that can actually uh, collect measurements of points to triangulate points down to the millimeter. Uh, and it looks like this when you're facing it. Uh, this is actually me, not really the most flattering part of me, but uh, there it is. Uh, and you can actually see here uh, Dr. Martiros and Olshansky on the other side, a beam of light is transmitted <clears throat> to the receiving prism here. That beam is bounced back and you can have an extremely uh, precise measurement of where some point is. And we took uh, hundreds of these points uh, in 2018, which was our last season of excavation that we were able to go out there. What did we use all of these points for? Well, we other than being able to identify where all the architecture is exactly, where all our finds are exactly within our, within our excavation, we also combine this with another method that we introduced, which is photogrammetry. So traditionally, if you would like a sort of bird's eye view of how your excavation works, you would need something like this on the right-hand side. This is not Moss's board, by the way, but you would need something like this on the right-hand side, which is a boom camera with the camera facing down. Instead, we experimented with a technique called photogrammetry, in which, as you can see the good doctor here, you walk around an area taking multiple photographs. In this case, I think it was between 50 and 70 at a consistent height, at a consistent angle. And then sometimes, if you're as graceful as I am, falling directly into the excavation area uh, because you can't keep your balance. But as you are taking these photographs, you are able to use software, as we did, we use software to connect all of uh, these different images to stitch them together to make a full 3D model. I'm not sure if you all can see this video. So this is actually one of the units that we excavated uh, both in 2017 or, and more recently in 2018. And apart from being a flashy and cool thing, it is also a very useful research tool uh, for the reasons that I'll mention now. So uh, we can actually be able to identify the outline of architecture, the height of uh, walls, stratigraphy, or the layering that's visible here using this uh, kind of research tool. So this was something new that we brought to the site, and we'll be able to report more on our results about this in the future as we're actively developing it. One of the things that we can do with these very high resolution 3D models is put them into a framework called GIS, or Geographic Information Systems. So we can take our points, 
the, our high resolution point data that we use the total station for, and we can take our 3D models and combine them together in this platform to be able to look at very concretely at the site where all of our finds are to help us answer questions, as Dr. Martyrus Nanoshansky said, about space. Where are people doing things in uh, these, uh, in, in, within the site? And so uh, this is what the interface looks like. And here's just an example. We can see, for instance, the occurrences of obsidian blades and bone tools together in this area. This was an area that was filled with faunal remains or animal bones, and it happened to have bone tools and obsidian blades. And again, bone tools and obsidian blades, which is moving towards answering some of our questions about activities. Obsidian blades and bone tools are used for cutting maintenance tasks. Uh, so this is one of the technologies uh, that we have been incorporating and we have been actively working on right now. In addition, <clears throat> we have been continuing the quest for the foods of these early farmers. Uh, and I'm going to briefly go over what that looks like. Uh, the very first step, and I'm here with Georgi Noro, and that's me, uh, is uh, you can see here that we have gridded out our excavation area, and we are putting dirt into bags. This is how sophisticated this technology really is. And what you're going to see is that out of the dirt in these bags, we are going to actually be able to extract the archeological plant remains that people grew, used, and consumed uh, around 6,000 BCE. So how do we do that? First, I would like to report on the work that has been done. And this is the work of Roman Hosepian. So uh, Roman Hosepian has been looking at the archeological plant remains recovered from Masi's floor, uh, specifically, especially those remains, and Dr. Martirosi Anoshetsky can correct me if I am wrong, but from 2012 to 2014, does that sound right? So he's been looking at those remains, and what he has found and, uh, is barley, <clears throat> and the seed images that you see here are burnt archeological plant remains. So these are the actual plants that were grown and used by the people of Mosses Floor uh, almost 8,000 years ago. So what we have is barley. We also have a kind of wheat uh, that is used in making bread, which I will remark upon uh, in a second, called uh, bread wheat. Here it's called naked wheat. We have emmer. If you've ever had an Italian salad, uh, farro, uh, that, that is the last surviving culinary use of emmer. And we also have grape that is probably wild. Again, all of this is coming from Masi's floor because this is well before the domestication of grapes, uh, about 2,000 years before the domestication of grapes. In addition, there's a really interesting item that is found and that I've recently confirmed, which is called false flax. Here we have a capsule of false flax. This is what the plant looks like um, in all of its glory, I would think. This is a field of false flax, a contemporary field from Poland. And false flax is actually a very useful oil plant. It, the seed itself can contain up to 43% oil and about 32% of protein. It's quite small, you can see here, about two millimeters. And what's very interesting is that this growing, the evidence of false flax that we see here is largely constrained to the Southern Caucasus. So this is very much a local, local knowledge of a, a growing a certain kind of food uh, for oil um, and possibly for protein. And that's something that uh, I will talk about momentarily. So we've continued that work uh, that Roman has been uh, examining. In 2018, we took about 93 bags of dirt from 37 contacts. That's about 1,000 liters of dirt again, from these sort of, in this gridding system, so we can identify where that dirt comes from. And what do we do with these bags of dirt? Well, we put it through what's called a flotation machine. And I'm going to remark on that very uh, briefly. But I do have to acknowledge, and not just acknowledge, but emphasize that the machine that you see here, the operation of it and the maintenance of it and the running of all the flotation is really the genius work of Georgi and his son Armin here. Uh, who created what I think is one of the best flotation machines I've ever worked with. Um, although, as you can see here, there wasn't, uh, there was all, always a little element of disagreement about, as you can see, Tigran 
uh, stepping in here about the best way to cut and put together some of the parts. Uh, but overall, the way that flotation works is the following. Uh, you have a main barrel, you have a secondary barrel, water is circulating through these two barrels, there's a mesh in the main barrel, and a smaller mesh at the end of the spout here. Dirt from the archaeological site is poured directly into this barrel. Those things that float to the top are typically burnt plant remains that then travel down the spout, are ca caught in this mesh here. That mesh is then taken, dried, and then sent to a laboratory. And then uh, I would be happy to talk about what happens to the stuff that sinks later on. But this is how we extract our archaeological plant remains uh, out of <clears throat> the uh, dirt that comes from our archaeological sites. So what have we analyzed so far from those 93 samples that I mentioned, those 93 bags of dirt that all got processed through flotation uh, by Georgi and Armand so patiently and wonderfully? Uh, I have been analyzing them with the help of uh, some of my graduate and undergraduate students at UNLV in the Paleoethnobotany Laboratory that I run there. So again, paleoethnobotany is the analysis of archaeological plant remains. And this includes project contributors like Carlos Romo Caballero, Melina Liu have worked on this material, Jordan Phillips, who's not pictured here, but Summer Shives, uh, who is pictured here, is uh, writing her master's thesis on a portion of this material, and which she's working on actively now. So what do we look at in the laboratory? Briefly, this is what you're looking at under the microscope. You have to very carefully sort through all of these remains. There's a, a, a process and what you get is uh, the actual uh, identified plant remains. So thus far, what have we seen? We are confirming uh, Roman's work uh, and we're synergizing very nicely with him. And the majority of what we have found so far is barley found by that uh, emmer wheat. Again, it exists as farro and uh, Italian salads today. And then also some really other interesting things like bread wheat. Now, uh, I'm not going to say a lot about this, but this actually does seem to be a very early adoption of bread wheat, even though bread wheat, which is the wheat that is used to make bread, is uh, present very early at many Neolithic sites throughout West Asia. Uh, what we see is that there isn't really a large scale adoption of bread wheat until thousands of years later, especially in the areas that correspond to the Levant today uh, and other areas. So the fact that it is actually, we have almost as much bread wheat, as much as we have emmer wheat, is very interesting and a question that we're going to continue exploring moving forward. We also have uh, peculiar little lentils that are quite small, uh, which we're also going to continue exploring because that seems to be a local variety of lentils. So this is uh, the work that we have done, uh, but now Dr. Martirosian Olshansky is going to tell you about some of the other technologies we've been using uh, to understand uh, life at mosques. I thank you, Dr. Farahani. Um, as promised, we're going to talk about uh, some of the evidence we have for human mobility and movement at Masis Blur. Uh, and I touched on the, the pottery briefly. Um, uh, the other line of evidence we have actually comes from obsidian, uh, from the obsidian tools. Uh, and as I noted, there's an abundance of, the, uh, of obsidian tools at most of the South Caucasus uh, Neolithic and Calcolithic sites, as well as actually uh, uh, Paleolithic sites, that, which are sites, the hunter-gatherer sites that predate the uh, establishment of farming communities in the region. And that is because the region, Armenia is part, in particular, has an abundance of these obsidian raw material sources. And you can see these are all indicated on the map by these triangles. All the triangles are volcanoes that produce obsidian. And obsidian is this um, very shiny stone type that's very easy to work. Uh, and when you uh, when you uh, produce anything, when you um, nap it, it produces a very, very sharp edge, um, as sharp actually as a modern day surgical scalpel. Um, 
uh, anyway, the abundance of the obsidian tools in this assemblages is not surprising because there is uh, abundance of raw material sources. But what can we do with these sources is, if we can find out which sources prehistoric uh, populations were using and whether uh, they gave a preference to one source over another, we can begin to understand some of their decision-making processes. Um, how they moved across the landscape and who they could have possibly interacted with, um, which in turn might tell us how these behaviors influenced the spread of technological innovation and social change in the region. So with some of these questions in mind, using portable X-ray fluorescence spectrometer, ask me what that is, Afterwards, I analyzed 854 obsidian tools and compared these to geological samples from Armenia, Georgia, and some of the sources located in eastern Turkey. And what I learned is that 79% of my data set comes from nine different sources. Some as close to Masis Blur as 400 kilometers and others as far as 350 kilometers. And this is about 250-ish miles, I think. What this translates to in terms of human behavior and decision making is that the inhabitants at Masis Blur um, were obtaining their raw material in a number of different ways. Um, and this is important because past research has suggested that they, in, at least in the Ara plane, they were using um, sort of this least cost um, uh, 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 method of obtaining material of wood, up to, um, obsidian in this case, which means they were, they would have gone to the nearest source in order to obtain a material in order to conserve, to spend the least amount of energy. Um, what our analysis is showing is that this is not the case. Their uh, acquisition patterns were a lot more complex. And um, again, this speaks to human behavior and decision-making. Um, the most predominant source is, of course, the source that's closest to them, which is the source of Artemi. You can see here, 240 out of 850 plus come from this source. And this is what's called direct acquisition. In other words, the inhabitants or some members of the, of the uh, settlement are going to the source for the sole purpose of bringing obsidian back to the settlement so that they can turn it into tools and use them as they need. However, they're also bringing back obsidian um, from further sources, sources that are 100 and plus kilometers away, such as the Putanasar and the Gerasar source. And uh, they, these are fewer in numbers because they're bringing uh, obsidian back as, a, as an afterthought, if you will. This, this um, acquisition is incidental to another activity that they're performing that takes center stage. And in this case, uh, it's actually hurting and we'll talk about that in a little bit. Um, the third way they get their obsidian um, into Masis Blur, is particularly the ones that come from Eastern Turkey, such as the sources in Pashinler and Bingul, um, which are 300 and plus kilometers away from Masis Blur, um, is probably it's people who are coming from these further regions to Masis Blur um, that are bringing these uh, singular examples of obsidian. It's not the Masis, uh, it's not likely that the inhabitants of Masis Blur are trekking out 350 kilometers to just get their raw material to bring it back and turn it into tools. Conversely, what we also know that obsidian from Armenia, particularly the Artini source, which has an abundance of very high quality obsidian, has been found at Domus Tepe, uh, a Neolithic site in central Anatolia, um, which has uh, been actually uh, being excavated by our very own Dr. Elizabeth Carter for a couple, number of years. Um, what all of this uh, obsidian um, acquisition shows is that obsidian sourcing can and does show that these settled farmers uh, did not live in a bubble. Um, they were rather plugged into the larger super regional interaction sphere of, of the Near East at large, um, which again tells, can tell us a lot about their decision making and uh, how it leads to social change in the region. 
another line of evidence for human mobility and long distance mobility comes from the isotopic analysis of um, sheep, goat, and cattle bones from Massey's Blur. Um, which shows, I won't go too much into the graphs, it's just there for people who understand a lot about it and you can ask me questions about it uh, during the Q&A, but what I will mention is that the analysis conducted by uh, Dr. Annika Janssen shows that the sheep and goat were herded at high elevations during the summer months and low elevations, that is in the Arak Plain, in the winter months, while the cattle was kept in the plain year round. Uh, and this is exactly what modern day herders in Armenia do. They're in the Arad Plain in the lowlands during, uh, during the winter when it's warm and they take the flocks up to the highlands during the summer warmer months um, when there is a, an abundance of pasture available in the highlands. Um, one thing I would like to point out is that there is this lone cow that has a sign high elevation signature year round and what that means is that what it was born, raised, um, and uh, uh, born and raised in in a high elevation zone, not in the Ararat Plain. And it's at this point hard to know if it ended up in the Ararat Plain and soon after was butchered. That's why it doesn't have a low um, low elevation signature, or if the meat or the bones themselves just ended up uh, at the site after the animal was butchered at, at a high elevation. Um, but again, the interesting thing about all of these analyses and the results is that it clearly shows that the population at Musty Spelur is highly mobile. It's moving around season, and at least some members of the population are moving around and they're interacting with other groups who might not necessarily be sedentary year round. The last bit of evidence uh, we have of mobility and long distance movement of people comes from DNA analysis of an adult male we discovered in 2014. Uh, there are lots of interesting things about the burial that I could talk about, but in the interest of time, I will only say that the way in which he was buried, lying down, um, stretch out, stretched out on his back, is quite unusual for Neolithic burials of the Southern Caucasus and the Near East in general. As the vast majority of burials we have, have are in there in the what's called a flexed position, just fetal position. Um, so while his position was unusual, everything else about it was very typical Neolithic. The, the burial goods that were placed with him, the fact that he was placed under a, uh, a household floor, um, all, of the, all of these indicated a Neolithic burial, and this was confirmed through carbon, uh, radiocarbon analysis, analysis, which placed the burial sometime around 5400 BC. Uh, now, Dr. Farahani, would you like to say a few words about the ADNA uh, results? Yes, I'd be glad to. Thank you very much, Dr. Martiros Janoshkansky. I will be uncharacteristically brief. Uh, we are showing here research that we have not done, uh, but is just an indicative paper of the topic at hand. And the topic is, uh, how does farming spread? So one of the major questions that it has been asked that archeologists have always thought about is, is farming spreading because uh, people are teaching each other how to do farming? Or is it that farmers are merely moving to new places and that is how farming spreads? So is farming spreading through migration or is it th spreading through the exchange of ideas where non-farming groups learn farming from others? So recently, uh, ancient DNA evidence has been helping uh, answer this question at a much larger scale uh, through looking at the ancestry of uh, individuals. So how related are some individuals? What ancestry do they share or not? So on and so forth. And previous research in this region, looking at uh, just uh, skeletal remains of people who uh, lived during this period of early farming, have found that all, by, by and large, the people who were previously mobile foragers and hunters adopted farming as a way of life. All we can say about the ADNA evidence right now that we are allowed to say is that the ADNA evidence substantiates but complicates this picture because it is showing that during this time, there are people who are already living there who adopt these technologies, but there are also people who are likely moving in from elsewhere. 
And that's all I'll say. Perfect. Thank you, Dr. Farahani. And as Dr. Farahani mentioned, we're, it's not our research, so we can't say a whole lot about this. Um, but again, stay tuned. There are lots of talks in the future and publications that you can look forward to. <laughs> Um, we will sum up uh, by saying that um, hopefully we have been able to illustrate through some of the finds uh, at Masis Blue, such as the Hall of Pottery, the obsidian tools, the, in, the ancient DNA stuff, and the human, uh, uh, sorry, not the, the isotopic analysis of sheep and goat. Um, that there is plenty of evidence that these farming communities in the Ararat Plain, uh, again, did not live in isolation. They were certainly not quarantining. Um, and they were rather plugged into the both regional and super regional uh, interaction sphere, uh, which facilitated most likely um, the future social, cultural, and later on the political change that we see in the region. And we will end with a big thank you to all of you who have stuck uh, with us for an hour. Um, this was a very, very quick and dirty introduction to some of the work that we've been doing at Masis Blur. So thank you very much for staying tuned.